Uh, my name is Lisa Bortolotti and I'm professor of philosophy at the University of Birmingham. And this year I'm also coordinating the activities of a group um, that is called Women in Philosophy. So in our group, we're interested in lots of different issues that concern um, women as philosophers, as students of philosophy and um, research in philosophy. And in particular, we are interested in thinking about ways in which research in philosophy can be more diverse and more inclusive. So uh, to this end, uh, today we have invited Dr. Anna Ikino, uh, to talk to us um, about a very interesting uh, project that she was heavily involved with and that she's still involved in. Um, and Anna is um, a philosopher of mind, and she works also in philosophical um, psychology, and she um, has a lot of interesting uh, research uh, uh, areas that she's working in, including delusion and conspiracy theories. But today she's going to talk to us about the creation of the very first uh, philosophy museum. So just to start with, Anna, um, how did you and your collaborators develop this idea of creating a philosophy museum? Thank you for the question and for inviting me to speak about this project, uh, which means a lot to us. So I'm a philosopher at the philosophy department at the University of Milan. I don't remember if you told me. And the idea originally was of my colleague, Paolo Spinici, who kept uh, uh, saying, uh, there are in the world museums about almost everything. There are museums of art, of science, of cinema, of um, like sex, of toys. There is even a museum for socks and a museum for frogs. Is it possible that there aren't yet philosophy museums in the world? So uh, it seemed to be an important topic and there isn't a museum devoted to it. And in fact, a, a quick Google search then confirmed by a more careful inquiry showed that uh, there apparently there aren't. So uh, we felt uh, it was time to fill the gap and to create the, the very first <laughs> philosophy museum. So that, that was the starting point. And it was at that point 2018 and our department got uh, some generous uh, extra funding from the Ministry of Research in, within an excellence award scheme. And part of this funding uh, had to be used for activities of outreach and, uh, and public engagement. So we decided to use this funding for, for this project. It was uh, about 50,000 euros. And thanks to this uh, funding, we could rely on the help uh, of experts uh, in this area. So museum experts, graphic, graphic designers, uh, multimedia studios, and all the sort of expertises that you need to, to create a, a proper museum. And so we, we tried to, to build a, like, like an aesthetically appealing and stimulating environment where philosophical idea can be communicated in fun and engaging ways. That was the idea. So our model were science museums. We didn't have in mind like um, an historically minded museums where you just passively contemplate relics about uh, the lives and works of uh, philosophers, but a more dynamic and interactive envir environment uh, indeed, like those, if you have in mind, of, of science museums, when where you have a number of games, activities, experiments, uh, aesthetic and intuitive experiences that lead you into the nature of philosophical problems. Of course, this is much more easier to say than to do. And uh, uh, it was quite an ambitious project and to put it into practice, we had to proceed gradually. So we started with a temporary exhibition, which uh, took place in our university in uh, November, 2019. Uh, and there we created the first two halls of what we would like to become a permanent museum, plus a third programmatic hall where we put um, we presented the plan for what still needs to be done. So that's that's what we did in short. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, very good idea, I think, to have a philosophy museum. Um, you already said a little bit about this, that you know there was a gap uh, and, and, and you meant to fill this gap. There wasn't any philosophy museum at the time. But what were your other objectives in creating a philosophy museum? What did you want to achieve? Well, basically, uh, the main objective was to make philosophy widely accessible, uh, accessible to people who are not and probably will never be 
into academic philosophy. So showing that philosophy is not just uh, an abstract and perhaps boring discipline that uh, can be addressed in libraries by reading long books <laughs> and studying. Of course, that's a way, an important way to access philosophy, but that's not the only way. But it can also be something understandable and fun and playful that can be accessed by people who are not uh, academics and, uh, and are not in interested in being. In so, being. so the idea was that if you make the, the gateway to philosophy enjoyable and, uh, and entertaining, then people may be, um, like, uh, may be willing to get deeper into it. Again, not necessarily by enrolling into a philosophy program, but uh, becoming in general more curious and open-minded and willing to explore some important philosophical tools and methodologies like uh, critical thinking and rigorous arguments. And uh, so the idea was that the, the museum experience could be the first step into a pathway of fruitful interaction where people eventually become better thinkers, uh, more critically minded and better agents in the, in the public debate. So we, we thought this could, in the long run, of course, could make a difference really to the climate of a, of a healthy uh, public debate in a healthy democracy. So that was the, again, the ambitious aim I know is, Sounds very cool, of course, then you should put it into practice, but this was the, the aim, I think. I think it's a very ambitious aim, but it's also a very important one and very timely, because uh, nowadays philosophers are getting really interested in our environment being epistemically polluted or being not conducive for to us thinking clearly and rigorously. So the idea that there could be some fun and engaging ways to encourage people to think more critically sounds excellent. Um, what were the main challenges that you encountered in this project? I imagine that many of you did not have experience in creating resources for a museum space. Yes, indeed. As I said uh, repeatedly, it was difficult. So the idea is cool, we think, at least, <laughs> but it was difficult and we, we were not really trained for that. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a bit like teaching the experience, even if you know something very well uh, and you study the subject for a long time, then teaching it in a way that is easy, understandable and engaging for students sometimes is hard. And in this case, it was even harder, I think, even those of us who are already a bit into public philosophy. What we are used to do in public philosophy, at least me, at least, uh, is to speak or to write in a fun and engaging way. But in the case of the museum, you really had to build activities and games uh, that must be accessible for someone who has no background whatsoever and uh, independently. So someone who walks into a room, maybe you are not there, and uh, she must find stuff and by herself uh, understand what's going on, find it interesting enough to go on staying there and uh, for 10 minutes and uh, like trying to figure out what she should do, what, what's the point. So re really creating things that speak for themselves and that can be enjoyed independently is pretty hard. And creating games, uh, one of the things we did that were, were really proper game, like goose games or like games uh, with for teams and things like this. Uh, is not easy. So we, we also had to ask uh, uh, professionals who are really into this, like into the creation and desi design of board games uh, or things like this. So uh, yes, it was uh, it was difficult. The first challenge is really that it's not something we are trained for, most of us at least. We did. So we had to learn a new job and, and ask, of course, uh, we didn't learn by uh, only by our like uh, alone in isolation, but we had to ask uh, professionals in other areas. And, and then, of course, it's not only difficult, but time consuming, because we did that on the top of the rest <laughs> of our job. So uh, it took like basically nights and weekends. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, uh, it required a lot of time and it were, it were quite a few of us. So all the department contributed, but the project really, it were three or four of us um, uh, who really were fully committed to the project. So it took a lot, a lot of work. And then, uh, of money, okay. If I think another challenge was it's expensive. If you want to build uh, something like that, really stays like in, like beautiful materials that can be used by many people and uh, can be appealing uh, in the way museums are, uh, you need money. And then, I mean, in the case of this temporary exhibition, at least we didn't have to rent. Uh, 
uh, allocation because the museum took place uh, into our university. We have a very nice historical building. The University of Milan is an amazingly nice building. It was in the main courtyard. Uh, there are two beautiful rooms with a nice view. So the location was amazing and was for free, of course, because the university supported us in this uh, respect. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, the aim is to make it permanent, so you, you need money also to rent spaces or to buy spaces. And uh, for the materials, you need to use quite good quality materials that can be touched by many people. And then the expertise, again, graphic design. So yeah, there is a financial challenge, which is also a, like an issue for the future of the museum. So the there were quite a lot of challenges indeed, but uh, yeah, so, uh, we definitely overcame them. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that sounds, uh, sounds fantastic, actually, what you did, overcoming all these challenges and, and creating this uh, exhibition, and then with the hope that we'll become a permanent museum. Um, so now I think we really want to know a little bit more about what a philosophy museum looks like. So maybe you can show us something and, and give yeah. us a sense of what it is to get into a philosophy museum. Sure, so I can share my screen, so i show you a few pictures of it. Okay. Do you see my screen now, right? Um, do you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, we can ah, see. Okay, it. sorry, I didn't hear you anymore. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah. Um, here, let's, it's kind of a virtual tour. So here you can see a picture of the museum entrance. Uh, which was like a big open, shaped as a big open book to symbolize the fact that uh, doing philosophy is not just uh, passively reading books, but means uh, walking through them and uh, then getting into them and playing with their contents. And then uh, this is a picture of the first hall, which was uh, smaller than uh, the, the big uh, second hall and a bit less uh, in, in interactive. It was, it was mostly an introductory hall where we like uh, was devoted to the nature of philosophical problems and the methodology. So we used uh, um, things like uh, and images like Mary Midgley conceptual plumbing or Wittgenstein fly bottle to convey the idea according to which uh, um, philosophical problems are in important respects conceptual problems which amount to analyzing concepts that normally uh, you use in a reflective ways. So visitors were led to realize the difficulty that arise as soon as you try to define common concepts like self, freedom, time, moral responsibility and things like this. So see, here you can see a couple of pictures. Uh, we used artworks, uh, posters to read, and then on the um, some sort of installations, and then on the walls there were block notices with longer explanations of the concepts we explained that people and visitors could take. Uh, they they could take uh, their sheet from the notebook and then at home uh, uh, read the whole story with with more calm. And then in this first room, we introduced two key philosophical tools that philosophers use to analyze concepts. We selected two that are the constructions of paradoxes and thought experiments. So, so far it was, as I said, a bit less interactive. There were activities and small games to, to play, but I think the second room was what really uh, like the more interactive and the one that is closer to how we envi envisage the philosophy museum to be. So in the second room, visitors could play literally with paradoxes and thought experiments in order to appreciate their heuristic role in philosophical inquiry. I give you some example of these sort of games and activities in the second hall. So uh, one which was very popular among other visitors was the um, guess who are you, so the personal identity goose game. So here, different theories of personal identity were illustrated through a journey into the um, relevant thought experiments. To begin uh, with, every player had to adopt one theory of personal identity. So you should do, you, you had to choose whether you are the bodily, you adopt the bodily theory, the psychological theory, or the brain theory. And then every square on the track, uh, you can see here was the game board, corresponded to the scenario of a different thought experiment. So scenarios like brain fission, brain transplant, teletransportation, metamorphosis, and things like this. And when you landed on a square, you have to pick a card 
uh, uh, where it was described the irrelevant thought experiment. So it was described a scenario of uh, teletransportation, for instance. And then you had to guess whether, according to the theory you choose, that was a scenario where you have survived or not. So in a scenario of brain transplant, for instance, if I, uh, I choose the psychological theory, would I survive or would I die? And then if you guess correctly, you could die the role once again. Otherwise, you are stuck. And, and then there were a number of other possibilities and, uh, and interactions you can have. You can try to kill the other op your opponents by putting them into scenarios where according to their theory, they would have died or uh, uh, make them stop it. I, I mean, th this is just to give you a sense of the sort of things you can do. There were a number of, uh, of, uh, of possibilities along the track, but the point was uh, try to uh, put the various theories of personal identities um, and to, um, to, to understand which ones work in which scenarios and which ones don't basically uh, i hope that was clear i know is it explaining it clearly was an, a, a challenging thing at the beginning you had to quickly explain people but then visitors understood quite well and there were typically this game was played into teams because there were more than one people wanting wanting to to play it at the same time and there were really heated discussion among the team on whether for instance a brain theorist would survive in teletransportation or things like this um then uh, there was there were many other games of this sort i just give you is that just people playing the uh, personal identity game uh, i give you a few other examples there was a par various va paradox of fiction games uh, one in which uh, the three mutually inconsistent proposition that give rise to the paradox of fiction corresponding to three different cards and players were asked to solve the paradox by disca discarding one of the three cards and finding a suitable alternative from a deck of cards uh, describing uh, um, different philosophical theories. So for instance, if you discarded the card according to which uh, we can feel genuine fear for Harry Potter, then you could pick the card describing uh, Walton quasi-emotion theory or things like this. And then uh, to further illustrate the uh, relations, the complex relations between imagination, emotion, and belief, we replicated a series of famous experiments you may know about, uh, where visitors were asked to do things like eating chocolates uh, shaped as dog feces, or signing a pact giving their soul away a to the devil, or wearing a fully sterilized pullover which uh, they were told belongs to a serial killer, or I think you may be familiar with this sort of experiments and uh, visitors were led to, to realize how difficult it can be to eat uh, chocolate shaped as dog feces, even if you know that it is safe and things like this. And uh, I hope this, I mean, I selected a couple of games and uh, exper experiments we had to give you a sense of uh, what, uh, what we had. We had then various uh, paradox of perception games uh, using drawers that people should open and, and in order to discover contents. Uh, we had, of course, trolley problems trolley problems games, which are quite easy to, <laughs> to reproduce because you can really use uh, uh, proper trolley and train trucks. Uh, then, then a very popular game was the Better Plato or Aristotle game, uh, School of Athens games, we call it. Uh, people uh, were introduced to the theories of the two philosophers and had to decide whether backing one or the other. And then eventually they could take like a souvenir picture, uh, putting them in the shoes or actually in the face of the relevant philosopher. And, um, and then another popular part of the museum were the one de devoted to animation videos. Here, I would like to, to show you one. We had videos um, on a number of philosophical topics, paradoxes, thought experiments, or simply philosophical problems. Here are just some examples of uh, videos we had. Um, shall I show you? OK, um, let me see. OK, I'll show you. Um, the uh, one of those videos to give you a sense of how uh, it worked. It's an animation video. It is in Italian. I think it will be sub subtitled, but uh, it's just uh, just to tell you, it's, it's an animation about the famous philosophical paradox uh, um, known as Buridan Us. You may know a bit about it already, but uh, it's the story of the hungry donkey who has to choose between two identical stacks of hay, both placed exactly at the same distance from her. 
And given that they are identical indeed, um, there is no reason to prefer one over the other. So she cannot choose and eventually uh, she doesn't eat either or neither of them and she starves to death. So the paradox arises because prima facie at least, it may seem that from a rational point of view, the behavior of the donkey make, makes sense because rationality requires or seems to require that uh, uh, in order to choose something, you must have good reasons to prefer it. Uh, so then it is rational for the donkey to starve. But of course, how can this be rational? And yeah, this is a parody of uh, the philosophy of um, uh, Jean Buridan, who thinks that sometimes we are rational in choosing not to choose. But of course, uh, that's a paradoxical conclusion, brings to a paradoxical conclusion in the case of the Buridan us. And so there are, there, this raises various questions about what is this rational and uh, how we should behave in decision making. And there are live inter uh, philosophical debates on this. So I show you the, the short video to give you a sense of how we tried to uh, reproduce those debates into a short animation. C'era una volta un asino che si chiamava Buridano. Era molto affamato e guardava due mucchi di fieno assolutamente identici, piazzati alla stessa distanza da lui. Quale scelgo? Non so proprio decidermi. Ciascuno dei due andrebbe bene, e dunque è razionale che non ne preferisca nessuno. Pensava Buridano che aveva ambizioni da filosofo. Incerto e affamato, Buridano morì di stenti, convinto di essere nel giusto. Poco dopo arrivò un mulo, il mulo Bernardo, che trovando l'amico morto, molto si rattristò quando seppe come erano andate le cose. Ma perché mai devi preferire qualcosa per sceglierla? Esclamò commosso il Bernardo. Andavano bene entrambi i mucchi. Potevi scegliere a caso l'uno o l'altro, visto che erano identici e non c'era niente di meglio. Questo sì sarebbe stato razionale. E poi, Buridano, sei stato vittima di un fraintendimento. In realtà avevi non due, ma tre possibilità. Potevi scegliere il mucchio di sinistra, il mucchio di destra o nessun mucchio. E hai scelto nessun mucchio, che era proprio l'unica cosa che non dovevi scegliere, amico mio. Pessima scelta dunque la tua. Davvero, Buridano, non eri per niente un asino razionale. Ok, that was it. And I think, well, that's just a picture of the third hall, which was the programmatic one, but uh, was not really a proper museum hall. I think I can, uh, I can, this is the museum team with our students who are the museum guides. And okay, here are some links, but now only I can stop right. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Really good rendition of the paradox, uh, really enjoyable to watch. Um, let's just bring this to a close, but before we do so, I want to ask you two more questions. One is um, whether you think that initiatives like the Philosophy Museum can really enhance uh, diversity and inclusion in the access to philosophical research. Right, uh, well, uh, I think so, we think so. And as I say, this was really our main aim, like to uh, like making philosophy accessible to a really wide and diverse audience. You may think I'm not the most objective person, <laughs> but I would say that to a, a reasonable extent we achieved this goal. So the, the museum opening times were divided in two parts. So in the morning, they were for uh, high school students and classes. And then the afternoon was the general uh, uh, public uh, of Milan city and other city if they wanted. So, and I think both, of both sort of public students and uh, general public responded really well. So the museum was open or the exhibition was open uh, for less than three, a bit less than three weeks. And we had more than 3000 visitors, including like a third of them were high school students. So we had many classes, like teachers that brought their classes there. 
And, uh, and then in the afternoons, we had about every afternoon um, with some, there were also some extra openings in the evenings and weekends. We had uh, long queues outside because the room were quite small and there were a long queue and people were willing to, to wait a long time in the cold <laughs> to, to see. And that was the first uh, good sign. Then we had really large media coverage. So uh, most Italian newspapers and TV, but also some uh, abroad uh, talk about us in quite enthusiastic ways. And, uh, and then we had really good uh, and a lot of good and enthusiastic feedback in the satisfaction surveys. And the, the thing that was, was most pleasing for us was the follow-up. So many people kept writing us uh, on the social uh, pro media profile of the museum. Like most, a lot of visitors kept writing and asking questions and asking when the museum will open again. And then perhaps the most interesting follow-up was with the high school teachers who basically after the museum experience, we created a sort of network with them. We are working together. Like they reuse the museum materials in their classes, the videos, and uh, and they made activities. Some students uh, created in a, in one of Milan High School. They created a room of the museum and they invited us to visit it. A room about freedom and philosophical issues about what it is to be free. And then use the format to uh, like apply to that topic. So and probably that part of the interaction was the most fruitful and the one that is still going on. But also, so yes, I think we did manage to reach surely. A, a large audience, then of course the aim would be even larger. But uh, yes, I think uh, there is a, a, a diversity and inclusivity uh, gain in, in experiences like this. Definitely sounds like it. Thank you so much. Very last question. What's next for the Philosophy Museum? Have you got any plans? Right, that's the key question. So as I said, Initially, originally, the idea was this to be a permanent thing. So we, we understood this since the very beginning as the first step toward the creation of a permanent museum. And the idea was to go ahead immediately. Then if you notice, the, this happened in November 2019. And then a few months later, the pandemic started and everything was frozen. And indeed, museums and public spaces like this were the worst thing ever. So uh, yeah, nothing happened for about one year. But then now, finally, we are back. And uh, um, after the, mm, the crazy <laughs> first crazy times where no one did think about the future, now we we resume the project and we are really determined to, to give it a, a future. So we are doing a few things. The first one um, is, a, is a recent good news. We got some funding for, um, we applied for a, within a public engagement award scheme and we had some little but uh, significant funding for a project on conspiracy theories and fake news. Uh, which basically consists in building a third hall of the museum devoted to this topic. So the idea of this project is to keep the museum format, that is an interactive exhibition with games, experiments and things, but applied to this specific topic of uh, misinformation and fake news. And uh, again, involving general public and high school teachers. And that's uh, a project we are already working together with the high school uh, teachers, because uh, again, the mornings will be devoted to schools. So we want to make sure that the contents are accessible and interesting for teenagers. So this is what we are working on at the moment. And the exhibition will take place in uh, February 2024. And again, it will be a temporary thing because funding is still not large enough. <laughs> But as in the case of the museum, our idea is that the materials and the things we create will become part of a third room of a permanent philosophy museums where, where we would like to have rooms devoted to many different problems and theories and traditions. So that's the, the first step we are working on more actively at the moment. And then we are in parallel, we are also applying for funding and uh, uh, looking for partners and for the permanent uh, step of all this project. So we are indeed looking for larger fundings and looking for partners because the project is really, as I said, the is a lot of work, many different expertises are involved. So we are looking for partners, both external stakeholders, but also academic partners who may be interested in joining. And we have already a network of people working on this. Um, and indeed, I, I could make a public call. <laughs> if, if any of you is interested in collaborating and uh, like uh, you or your institution in uh, helping developing the idea of a philosophy museum, 
it would be great we think if uh, like uh, philosophy museums uh, like many philosophy museums flourished in the world a bit like science museum that every town has her own philosophy museum the, the final aim could be this and uh, and indeed you need really a lot of different forces and expertises to to realize the thing so uh, that's what we we are currently working on and uh, yeah so if you are interested, please get in touch and, uh, and we can, uh, we, are, we have already contacts with other Italian universities and uh, also other, some abroad. I, I don't disclose the details now, but hopefully soon you will hear about, uh, about uh, some like uh, news about the permanent things uh, uh, warning, but uh, yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you, Anna. This is very, very inspiring. And I think, you know, I, my, at least in my head, lots and lots of ideas are starting to pop up. And I imagine it would be the same for anybody who is interested, who loves philosophy and is interested in bringing philosophy to as many people as possible. So thank you so much for your time today, being with thank us you. and being so generous with, with your time and describing everything about the Philosophy Museum. And um, I think it's been really, really interesting and best of luck for the future steps. And, uh, really thank you very that, much. You know, what you have envisaged will become a reality at Philosophy Museum in every city. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Thank you, thanks to you.